Uh, so today's plan is to discuss the first couple sections in chapter one. Um, I'd like to give a quick little introduction to sig figs. It's gonna kind of like jump into the middle of the topic. This uh, will help some of you guys if you're working on some lab stuff over the weekend. Um, or if you want to get a jump start on the homework, this might get you a little bit of a jump start on that particular topic. And also it may just generally kind of fit in with some of the other work if you've already watched some of the videos and seen some of the, the, the things that are online. Maybe you've already been working on some of these sig fig problems. So we'd like to um, spend as many lectures as we can talking about that particular topic because that's one that um, I find students often struggle with. But it's uh, a topic that if we can see examples in a few different lectures in a few different ways um, will make sense. Um, hopefully within about a week, if not sooner. Um, and then at the end of class, hopefully we can you know, stop and talk about things, about the course. So getting into chapter one, um, the basic here is like, well, obviously we're studying chemistry, like every uh, textbook seems to start with the definition of chemistry. So we're studying the properties of matter, uh, the structure of matter, the transformations of, of matter. So we'll get into all those topics in this class. The later half of the class ends up getting into the structure of molecules, so talking about like Lewis structures, three-dimensional shapes. Um, into 1220, you start getting into some properties that then are sort of reflective of those shapes. We get into, I guess, a little of those in chapter uh, 11 as well, in terms of like boiling point trends as a function of like polarity and the structures of molecules. So towards the end of the class, we get into some of the properties um, of molecules as they kind of uh, reflect off the structure of the molecules. The early part of the class, we talk a little bit more about reactions um, and uh, sort of atomic structure. So we talk about atoms in chapter two, get into reactions in chapter three, reactions in water in chapter four, and then talk about heat changes in reactions in chapter five, um, so thermochemistry. These are probably mostly topics you've seen before. It doesn't mean you remember them, I understand that. But uh, probably mostly things that hopefully are hammering on some different topics you have seen in high school that we can build from. Um, some of you guys come in with a poorer background than others. Some come in with a stronger background than others. If you are sort of hearing a lot of words for the first time, either in chapter one or two or three, just hit the books a little bit harder. You know, rewatch videos, reread things, try more problems, make sure to look at those uh, quizzes um, every day. Um, to, to, to give you that exposure. So I think if you give yourself the added exposure, you'll catch yourself up pretty quickly. But so what we like to do here in this class through 12, 10, and 20 is gain sort of that atomic perspective, the molecular perspective of thinking about molecules as you know, the, the way they appear in terms of their like, three-dimensional shapes. That ends up coming into play a lot in 25, 10, and 20 if you take the organic chemistry sequence in terms of thinking about organic molecules and their properties and their reactions um, are often reflective of just thinking about things like their polarity, their shapes, things that we begin discussing in this chapter. Um, why we study chemistry, well, for most of you guys, it's because you have to, right? I mean, I doubt any of you guys are just like, oh, I feel like taking chemistry. A uh, few of you maybe um, are here as like GE, fulfilling some GE requirement, but most of you are probably here because you have to take the next chemistry, the next sequence, you wanna go to med school. Um, I think you know, if we're gonna be uh, pumping patients full of drugs at some point, I don't know, maybe that's not all doctors do, but if you're gonna be prescribing medications, you should probably understand you know, the basics of molecular structure and shape and functionality and those sort of things. So I think there's a lot of reasons why if you're heading towards a medical career that you know, studying chemistry is really important to that other than just check checking some box off a prerequisite. Um, but obviously, uh, chemistry helps solve problems too. So chemistry is helping solve problems of energy by trying to create new types of uh, energy storage. Uh, in, in forms of batteries, trying to come up with new types of fuel cells, um, uh, sort of research in biochemistry, helping design new drugs, things like that to help people. Um, obviously involved in technology, medicine, even like food industry relies on chemistry, uh, chemistry and chemists along the way. So I think there's a lot of aspects of chemistry in the real world if you are interested in this field. So feel free to check out the chemistry major if you have. I won't be slighted if you continue on and, and, and study some other major. But um, so chemistry is pretty important, I think. Um, at the very least, we have to get through this class to do well to get to the next class. So I think we can all appreciate that need. Um, so anyways, getting into some of the basic terminology in chapter one, we get into things like the atom. That's, you know, of course, our basic building block of matter. I think we all understand that. That, um, that elements are uh, uh, sort of each atom is characterized as being of a uh, particular element. The particular element, uh, we'll get into chapter two, Things you already know, I'm sure, about how the proton count in the nucleus is really defining our different uh, atoms. So hydrogen has one proton in its nucleus. Helium has two protons in its nucleus. Um, you know, like carbon has six protons in its nucleus. Uh, we can't just easily exchange these protons. You can't just like add a proton to an atom and turn it into some other nuclei by some easy chemical means. So you're kind of stuck with the atoms as they are, sort of 
um, uh, as long as we're being chemists, if you're a nuclear scientist, you can do almost anything you want, but um, if we're thinking of chemical reactions, you can easily do in the lab, or just interconverting the bonds between atoms um, and making new types of compounds as we think of chemical reactions occurring. Uh, a compound specifically has two elements or more. So for something to be characterized as an element, or excuse me, for something to be characterized as a, uh, as a compound must contain two or more elements. So you know, for something to be a compound, we have to have some types of bonds going on between the substances, so two plus elements to be a compound. So if you have something like oxygen gas or nitrogen gas, so if you say like N2, um, it's obviously in the room, 78% of air is nitrogen um, in the form of nitrogen molecules with two nitrogens bonded together. This is a molecule but not a compound. Uh, and it's not a compound because it only contains one element. Um, so you'd have to have something like water. So this would, you know, water would exist as a molecule and you can also call it a compound. Um, sometimes we might call it like a molecular compound. That will differentiate something that we'll talk more about as we get through chapters two um, and beyond of ionic compounds. So something like NaCl, by nature you might look at that and say, okay, is that a molecule too? Can we characterize that as being a molecule? Not really, it's more of the ion, so sodium plus uh, forms the cation, chloride, uh, chlorine forms the anion, and then you have a series of plus minus um, ions all attracted together. So you never really have just like one entity of one sodium and one chloride like floating around some mixture. It's usually millions of ions of plus and minuses all interconnected together. So usually we look at this, call it a compound, it's usually, we're not thinking of it as being a molecule though, so it's really not a molecular compound. We tend to think of this as being an ionic compound. And we'll talk more about ions when we get into chapter two. But just kind of differentiating two different uh, major types of compounds, those being molecular, where we have covalent bonds linking the atoms, versus where we have uh, the uh, uh, electrostatic forces of attraction that, it's, uh, that attract the plus and minus ions together, holding our ionic compounds together. This just helps us kind of start picturing things or start making sure that when we're thinking of a sample of water, we have a bunch of individual connections of two hydrogens to one oxygen floating around. When we think of NaCl solid, we're kind of thinking that we have just millions of plus, minus, plus, minus, and some sort of pattern repeating throughout that structure. The chapter discusses chemical versus physical properties. Of course, chemical properties are, or chemical reactions are where we're actually changing and exchanging uh, bonds among the atoms. So it's where we're actually taking something like maybe hydrogen and oxygen and forming water. If we want to balance this, this is a little bit more in the chapter two, but I'm sure we've all seen balanced uh, chemical reactions where you have to balance our two hydrogens, uh, two molecules of H2 on the left side, a molecule of O2 combining to form two molecules of water on the right side. Um, so this is kind of our before, so you could have those substances present before and then the water present after the reaction takes place. So that would be an example of a chemical reaction. A physical reaction is just changing the temperature of a substance, um, changing the physical state, so changing water ice to water liquid. You're not fundamentally breaking the bonds between the molecules of oxygen, you're just kind of breaking the attractive forces between, um, or ex uh, changing the forces that unite water molecules that are adjacent to each other. So obviously, if we have ice, we have more frozen out molecules. We have liquid water, they're still interacting, but they're tumbling around each other. But you still have individual water molecules in each of the cases. Um, uh, the uh, chapter also discusses intensive versus extensive properties. I, um, I think the big uh, thing here is that the intensive property, these are our characteristic properties. So a characteristic property is one that's independent of the quantity of the substance. So intensive, independent of the mass of the substance. The extensive property is just relating to like how much of the substance you have. So an extensive property really isn't um, a property that's uh, reflective of any specific uh, property of the substance. It's usually just more reflective of how much of the substance you actually contain like a liter of water or two liters of water or three liters of water. That's not some fundamental property of water. That's just however much you happen to have. But the melting point of water is the same regardless if you have a liter or two liters or three liters. So uh, the boiling point of water is the same regardless if you have a lot or a little. Um, so most of your properties, like the density of water, is always a gram, about 1.0 gram per milliliter, regardless of how much you have. Um, so the intensive properties, these are the things that we can characterize a substance with. So you know, things like melting points, boiling points, densities. 
et cetera. So a characteristic property is just one that um, you might want to characterize and compare because different substances will have different characteristic properties. So if you have methanol instead of water, different boiling point, or you would expect them to have some sort of different properties in terms of melting point, boiling point, densities, et cetera. So there's this picture um, that kind of goes through the basic composition of matter. The one thing I think that's a little confusing with this picture is it's not showing us every form of matter. It's just showing us a few different like common uh, forms that we encounter matter in where we can encounter atoms of a particular element. Now, there's only a few elements where this can be. These are the noble gases where we would have a stable. Um, and what's being reflected in this box appears to me to be like a gaseous element. So thinking of uh, um, a, an element on the periodic table that exists as just a single atom, not bonded to anything else, that would really just be our noble gases. Um, all the other substances would either be some sort of metal solid or they'd be some sort of maybe um, diatom like oxygen or nitrogen or hydrogen where we have two atoms bonded together um, for that substance at room temperature. So the, the box here might be depicting you know, N2 molecules within a box. Um, so other elements might be existing as like a solid or a liquid, like mercury is a liquid, bromine is a liquid. Turns out that those are the only two liquids of the elements in the periodic table. Everything else is either a solid or a gas. Um, so the uh, other forms of matter, of course, we could have molecules. We have different types of compounds that uh, have formed between different elements. So maybe this is an example of something like NH3. Obviously, you can imagine several different types of compounds. They could be solid, liquids, or gases. The particular box here is maybe just depicting a, a gas. The reason why I might be depicting these uh, boxes as gases is because the particles are pretty far away from each other. If we have a liquid or a solid, we'll pick this up in chapter uh, 11 and 12. They're going to be much closer together if we're in those uh, physical states. Then, of course, we could have mixtures where we have the different substances together. Um, and obviously, you can mix all different kinds of things together. And they can mix together perfectly where you have a homogeneous mixture, or maybe they don't mix together like oil and, and vinegar, and you have um, separate layers, and you have a heterogeneous mixture. That's actually, well, the, the next slide will be on characterizing substances as homogeneous or heterogeneous in their nature. Uh, of course, we can uh, uh, define the physical state. Most substances can go from either exist in the solid phase, uh, the liquid phase or the gas phase. You know, some substances like sugar, if you, if you uh, try to melt sugar, eventually it caramelizes and changes form. So not everything can go through the whole cycle of you know, melting into the liquid, boiling into the vapor phase, and then going backwards. But the things that do are not changing their covalent bonds. So you know, when you think of water boiling, it's just going from water where the molecules are all adjacent to each other, tumbling around, to them being separated from each other. And then you could condense them and go right back to where you were before with liquid water. So the key here is just that we're not changing the nature of the molecule of water. We're just changing like how far away or how the molecule is interacting with the other molecules it's in, in uh, uh, the surroundings with. So in ice, the water molecules pretty still relative to each other. Um, in the liquid water tumbling, but you still have water molecules. In the gas phase separated, water molecules not really interacting anymore. Okay, so as we think of matter, we can start to characterize it as being uh, perhaps uniform throughout or not. This is usually a question, so if you're, if you're looking at a piece of matter, it could be anything you can imagine, um, you could usually like, okay, the iPad. Like, so is the iPad homogeneous or heterogeneous? What do you guys think? It's heterogeneous. And so the, the, the question that you really have is, is the whole thing appear to be the same? You know, and so if it were like a block of iron, and it would all appear to be mostly the same, like if it were like a cleaned up block of iron, you know, like a, if it were nice and polished and all that. So if you had a nice clean piece of iron, you'd probably say, well, this appears to be heterogeneous. The whole thing is gray. I can't see any imperfections or any differences. Obviously, the iPad, soon you have your glass, the rest. So it's pretty obvious that the iPad's heterogeneous. It's usually pretty easy to assess the, the, the question of heterogeneous versus homogeneous just by appearance. But now if I gave you a chunk of, of uh, what appears to be a metal, like say it's gray, solid throughout, um, and then ask you, is it one substance or multiple substances? You'd probably be like, how am I supposed to know? Because it could be an alloy, where we ha maybe have some carbon added to the steel, um, or it could be two different types of metals bonded together. You would have no idea. So to address the next question, if you have a substance that appears to be homogenous, um, by, by your eye, it looks like it's one single phase 
all the same appearance to, to the naked eye. To address the question of does it have a variable composition, usually you have to know something about the substance. You have to know how it was made, what went into it. Usually you can't just look and answer this particular question. So the question would be, does it have a variable composition? Now, again, you can't just look and tell, but it's really just saying, is there one substance and then a different substance? If that's the case, then there's a variable composition, because some of the things, like imagine you had um, uh, coffee. So coffee would appear to be homogenous if you just talked about the liquid inside of, say, my cup, it is coffee. Um, and if you knew anything about coffee, and I think we all do, you would know that there has to be water, there has to be whatever that makes coffee coffee, and then there's like the sugar and the milk and all that goes with that. So we have definitely a mixture, appears to be homogenous. I know something about it, so I know there's different substances. I don't know exactly what all the substances are, but I could point to, okay, there's sugar in there, there's water, there's the flavorings of coffee. So I definitely know that a cup of coffee would have a variable composition because I know something about how it was made. Um, so then if we have a, um, say we know something to be a homogenous mixture, we just know there's multiple substances. Those substances could be elemental, um, Maybe not the most common type of mixture to have elemental substances, but you could imagine, uh, I don't know, a good example of uh, an element we would have and something we would eat. Like you see food labels that have, you know, uh, calcium and magnesium. Those are ions that are paired together with some sort of anion. You're not eating like pure metal when you're eating like your Cheerios or whatever. Um, so, you know, we're usually not ingesting and thinking of our food as containing pure elements, but, you know, you could imagine a sample that was comprised of some pure elements as well as maybe some types of compounds. Now, if you said um, you now know, maybe you have a cup of water, you know it's relatively pure uh, water, so you know it's a pure substance. And if that's the case, then you might want to address, is that pure substance an element or a compound? And so then the question you might ask is, does it contain more than one kind of atom? Um, again, you're not just going to address that by naked eye. You have to know something about the sample. Um, and so if it has just one element present, it's an element. If it has two or more elements present, it's a compound. So this is just how you can basically classify matter, try to get down to, um, you know, is it heterogeneous? Uh, if it is, you know it must contain two or more different uh, substances. If it's homogenous, then the question is, do you know something about its uh, composition? If you do, then you can address whether it's homogenous or it's pure. If it's pure, the question then is pure compound or pure element. Um, let's go through an example with this. Um, and the, uh, it, it may seem like this problem has a bit of a trick to it. Um, I'm going to open this up to you guys on top hat. But just give it a try. If you think it's a trick question, we'll go over it afterwards and, and discuss it. OK, so you should be able to answer with the top hat app now. Does everyone see it loaded? If it has. And you should be able to log in if you don't have the app just to tophat.com. Our course code is That's our <laughs> yeah, they like my lectures. They're probably like, so quiet, they must have left. <laughs> the, uh, that's like the preparation lab. If we do demos and things, we'll probably blow up a balloon on Monday, so that they'll be the ones who prepare that. OK, so just what everyone's answered, um, the, uh, I'll, I'll leave it open. So if you are still trying to figure out how to get logged in and all that, you can still give an answer. Uh, but the, um, so the sample definitely does contain molecules because we know, you know sugar is 
well, I think we know sugar is a molecular compound, like glucose would be an example of uh, a molecule. Um, definitely a compound, because like glucose, if we know like C6H12O6 or sucrose, C12H22O11, you don't necessarily have to know the formula, but you know that those are definitely compounds. Um, the sample appears to be homogeneous. This might be where, um, and, and these two questions might be where you kind of thought this was a trick, because here's a question for you guys. Do you think um, a sample of table sugar is just one sugar? Like, what do you guys think? Do you think there's, do, who thinks there's more than one type of sugar in table sugar? Who thinks table sugar is mostly just one sugar? What's that? Yeah, like if you're just talking like white sugar that. Yeah, it's probably mostly sucrose. Um, it, it's pr there's probably some other you know sugars in there too. There's probably like a little bit of fructose. Probably not a lot, but there's probably some. You know, there's always this issue whenever we say you have water. Uh, unfortunately, it's, it's never 100% pure. It's almost like nothing is ever 100% pure. So whenever we say you have a substance, usually we're assuming, you know, um, that, that when we say something's like pure sugar, it's like 99 or, you know, percent sugar. Um, so there may be some other things. There may be some dissolved water that has, like, absorbed out of the air in the sample. So there may be more than one different type of substance. It appears to be homogenous still. So if you have table sugar, it would appear white. All the crystals would look mostly the same. So it would appear homogenous. Whether or not it's homogenous doesn't address whether there's more than one substance there. So none of these questions here are exclusively saying there's just one molecule. So that's one little caveat. So if you, had, if you were a little bit confused in this question and thinking, well, what if there is some dissolved water? It would, it, the sample could still be homogenous. The sample would still contain you know, a compound. It could contain still multiple compounds. Um, the sample would definitely contain molecules. Um, but the sample is just not heterogeneous. So it can't be homogenous and heterogeneous. So I think most of you guys had the answer correct as the, um, the term that does not describe the sample is that it is not a heterogeneous mixture. Okay, now I think if I move to the next question, that one should stay open. So I see everyone who's currently logged in has actually answered. Um, so then we get to one other question. Okay. So which substance uh, or substances below is best described as being a pure element? Okay, so we'll take a look at this one here. So my, my recommendation for most of our lecture problems in class is, you know, for the first minute or two, give it a try, and then the next minute or two, I'm more than uh, fine to have you guys kind of compare answers. Uh, did anybody give an answer and then change it just out of curiosity? Because I think you can do that. Um, um, until I hit stop, I think you can change the answer. Um, you know, the, the point of the problems here is to keep you engaged, to get you trying, you know, and I, like, I want you all to get 100% on your lecture scores. If you remember from the first time, from the first lecture, we talked about how I let you earn a small bonus every time you're right so that we're not overly concerned about just getting the right answer. So I think we're all sort of free to try um, giving an answer. And then within you know, a few moments of um, you know, comparing your answers with your classmates, you can change your answers too. That's fine. Hopefully you, you change the right answer. This one is, again, kind of like a weird question. But it's one where um, we can go through some like process of uh, elimination to eliminate some of the answers. 
And so the um, way I might think of this is like earlier we were talking about coffee. Obviously, I think we know that coffee has to contain whatever coffee is and water. You know, so we know um, coffee is definitely not an element. We know an ice cube contains H2O, so we know that's not an element. The air you breathe might be tricky because you breathe oxygen out of the air, but we're also not really taking in the nitrogen in air. So air is a mixture of oxygen, only about 21% is oxygen, 78% is nitrogen, oddly about 1% is argon, um, and then the rest is the, the stuff we'll argue about, things like CO2 and water vapor, stuff like that. And so the air you breathe is not a pure element. It does contain pure elements, but it is not just one single pure element. And then the lead in the pencil is actually not lead, of course. Um, what, what's in a pencil? Does anybody know? <laughs> graphite, you all know that. Um, so I think everyone knows that graphite's actually in a pencil, but you may not know, you may have forgotten, or, or you may be going, ah, that graphite is just one of the elemental forms of carbon. So carbon solid, one of its forms is graphite. That's the relatively cheap form. Diamond is another form. Like carbon nanotubes are another form. Bucky balls are another form of carbon. Carbon's a really fascinating element in that it forms so many different types of what we might call allotropes. Um, an allotrope is just a different form of an element. Oxygen um, has an important allotrope. So most of oxygen exists as O2, but you do get some O3, and, and that's ozone, yeah. And so ozone forms like in lightning strikes. So uh, when you have high energy around with oxygen, uh, with say like a, a light source, um, then it can form things like ozone from that high energy. And so, uh, and of course, ozone layer is very important and all that, but these are just the two allotropes of oxygen, the two common forms that oxygen exists as. So the lead and the lead pencil, of course, is just carbon and graphite. Um, so then moving, uh, moving to a new topic. I, I guess if there ever is a question after a problem, feel free to raise your hand throughout the class. I don't mind taking questions even in a big class. So any point throughout the semester, if you do have questions, feel free to raise your hand. If you want to come up after class, ask questions too, that works. If you want to email me, I try to respond quickly to emails. So even if you have a question after lecture, I'll try to answer. However it is you want to try to get your questions addressed, feel free. Um, the next topic in the uh, chapter, I think it is section 1.3, uh, is on the topic of separations. So how would you separate a mixture if you had a mixture? Um, a filtration is the easiest way to separate a mixture if that is helpful for the type of mixture we have. Obviously, if you have a solid and a liquid mixed together using like filter paper, there's a really obvious way to separate uh, the components of that mixture. Now, the thing that's maybe not so obvious is how uh, and we get into this like later in the class on how maybe you could take a, uh, a solution that's just a liquid, add something that makes one of the things turn into a solid, and then use the filtration. So the filtration is obvious when you have a solid and a liquid, but it's a little less obvious when you have substances in a liquid where you kind of say maybe, you know, can I precipitate one of the substances out and not the others? Um, so that I can then use a simple filtration technique to make the separation. So just using filter paper, really easy to separate a solid liquid mixture. Um, a slightly more complicated um, uh, separation task would be a distillation. So distillation works. The example that the book uses is salt water. So imagine you have NaCl um, dissolved in water. Uh, the melting point of sodium chloride, if you had it as a solid, is like 800 degrees C. Uh, the melting point, or the uh, boiling point is even higher. So uh, the boiling point of water, of course, is 100 degrees C. So if we try to uh, boil a mixture of salt water, predominantly we're going to get the water vapor boiling first off of that mixture. And then we can condense the water vapor here with a cool water condenser. That just helps actually condense the vapors back into the liquid state. So you sort of vaporize uh, the most uh, volatile or the, highest, uh, the, the, the lowest boiling substance first in that case being the water in this mixture, and then you collect the water down in your cold flask. Um, and then you now have a more pure water source. Now sometimes you might have to do this more than once. So sometimes you might get still some uh, sodium chloride coming over, so you might have to do this um, uh, sort of procedure more than one time to come up with the purity of water that you're looking for. You could also do this with uh, maybe something like ethanol and water. So obvious, well, this is the, the structural sort of linking of uh, ethanol would be a CH3 group, then a CH2 group, then an OH group. We'll get into a little bit of the structure and naming of alcohols later in chapter two, but that's ethanol. Anybody know the boiling point of pure ethanol off the top of their head? It's about 78 degrees C. Um, not that I expect you to know that, but just in the event that somebody knew it, maybe you would know it. Um, Water is 100 degrees C in terms of its boiling point. So if we were to distill an ethanol water mixture, 
then our, our distillate's gonna have more of the ethanol. So you're gonna have more of whatever has that lower boiling point collecting in that um, receiving flask whenever you do a distillation. Now, I think there's a setup for a distillation. At some point, you'll see you know, one in the lab. Um, then you'll be doing these more when you get to OCHEM if you take that class in the labs that go with it. So when you get to OCHEM, you get to do some more of these. Um, fun, I think it's fun to do with a distillation. Uh, another sort of uh, um, separation technique is something called chromatography. This is what happens like ink on a pen, you know, when water gets on it and you can see like a black pen, the ink separating. And usually you, you might see like the purple and the blue inks because the, the black ink dye is really just a mixture of different dyes that make that color uh, appear to be uh, the black color. And so you could do the same sort of thing like purposefully to separate uh, a mixture. So say you have some liquid that contains a couple different components within the liquid. Imagine you have a couple different molecules that are dissolved in some kind of solvent. We can load them onto what we call a column that you could fill with something that's like a solid. The solid material can interact with those molecules that are in our liquid and then start to separating them uh, and, and start to allow them to separate and more slowly or more quickly go through the column. So you can imagine that the, the column is just uh, something that has a solid material that has like a bunch of different functional groups or things that can bind molecules as they're flowing through. And if things are more sticky, if they have maybe also more types of functional groups on them that are uh, attracted to the, the sort of stationary phase, that solid material in your column, it's gonna take them longer to flow down the column. Um, we don't talk much about this in Gen Chem. This is more of a topic or a technique that you do in OCHEM, uh, but I just thought I'd mention it's in the book here. So it's not really one that is really useful for what we do in the chemistry lab here in general chemistry, but it's just something that if you had different types of molecules and a liquid solvent, and you had the ability to do one of these types of uh, uh, chromatography type experiments, you might use that to separate that type of, um, that type of mixture. Okay, so I just wanted to ask one question on um, distilling ethanol and water. Um, the, just getting it open on top hat. So the mixture, uh, so a mixture that is 50% ethanol, 50% water by volume is distilled until about half of the original volume remains. It says look up the boiling points of these liquids, uh, but we already have discussed those, so I, I don't think you need to actually look them up. But then, um, which substance is greatest quantity in the distillate? Okay, I, uh, I guess I didn't realize I more or less gave this answer like two seconds ago, but um, I should have more carefully thought out the example I was gonna talk about on the previous slide so that I, um, yeah. but, but I think it's a relatively easy still to address question because you're just trying to figure out which substance is lower boiling. That's a substance that's going to be in higher composition when we collect the new recondensed liquid. And so the recondensed liquid is going to have more ethanol in it. Um, and so whatever of the substances that are present in the uh, mixture of lower boiling, so we want the lower boiling substance, um, that's gonna be the one that has uh, the greater likeliness of being boiled off first and appearing in the, uh, the recondensed liquid. Okay. Moving on, so what I wanted to do today at this point 
is just get into the, um, the nuts and bolts of significant figures. Um, for whatever reason, this topic is like the one topic that, that um, just lasts in chemistry weeks into the class where maybe a lab report comes up and you make a mistake on sig figs, you lose some points, and then you feel bad or annoyed or, or whatever. Um, it's really not the hardest of topics. It's like everything about sig figs is like on this one slide. And um, we can see a couple examples to make sure we get started. You may have, if you watch some of the, the lecture videos, you may have seen some similar type examples. Um, and I think even a couple of these examples can help us if we're stuck and remembering the rules. But so here's the, the, the main idea with sig figs. Um, so the idea of sig figs is the, um, whenever we start doing calculations with like major quantities and we start getting results, we have to figure out where we need to round the result to or report the result to with some uh, degree of like accuracy. Any of you guys in a stats class this semester too? Like stats kind of tries to do this with some more um, um, maybe sophisticated techniques. Like in stats you might actually talk about how maybe a mass, if you say 75 grams, what's the plus minus on that, that measurement? And then actually carry and do the arithmetic on those uncertainties through a calculation. So you might do a problem with some plus minuses and report a result with a plus minus. That's kind of like what the sig fig rules are trying to do, but without doing that added arithmetic. So they're just trying to come up with some generalization for how results should be reported, but it's for when we're dealing with what we often call measurements or inexact quantities. So whenever we see some ordinary lab type measurement or a, a number that we suspect is just some sort of measured quantity from the lab, like 75 grams, like we see that number in a problem, we don't know anything about it. Like we're just adding 75 grams plus 75 grams. But uh, just in my head, I'm seeing a value with a unit. That's an inexact quantity. That's some sort, of, some sort of ordinary lab measurement. And so whenever we start doing calculations with ordinary lab measurements, I need to start thinking of where the results should be rounded to or reported to um, with that degree of, of sort of uh, precision and accuracy in mind. So when adding and subtracting, whenever we do those types of math uh, steps, what we need to do is look at the decimal places. And we'll do a couple examples here today. Um, so we can kind of see what that means. But we're going to look at the decimal place that's sort of higher in quantity and round the results to that particular placeholder. Okay, so let's do an example of that right now. So like, let's do this example down here. 75 grams plus 75 grams, really easy. 150 grams is what would um, be the numerical answer to that problem. But the key is how many digits in that number are significant in the 150 grams? Like where should I report that result to? And let's think of it this way, if I'm saying um, the difference is really saying, is it 150 plus or minus 100? Is it 150 plus or minus about 10? Or is it 150 plus or minus about 1? And so the difference there, if we're reporting this as like, imagine we're reporting this as 1 times 10 to the 2, 1.5 times 10 to the 2, versus 1.50 times 10 to the 2. Do you see the difference there between those three numbers? How they kind of mean something different. One of them means we only have like one digit of precision. We only have like one significant figure in that number. The next number means we have like two digits in the number. So we have like two significant figures in the result. And if I write it this way, then I have like three significant figures in the result. And if I think of it this way here, that this is the plus or minus one gram. You know, that's like our uncertainty. Like when we look at 150, if like, if our uncertainty is in that last digit, then we should report that digit. And that should be where the number is reported to. We should give it with three significant figures. So if we go back to the rule, the rule says when adding and subtracting, answers are rounded to the least significant decimal place. So one's placeholder, one's placeholder. I should report the result to that one's placeholder. So that decimal place right next to the decimal. So that means I should give the result with three significant figures. So all, di all three digits here are significant. And to unambiguously show three significant figures, when, we're, when we have like a zero ending without a decimal place, we should probably use scientific notation. Because in scientific notation, if I use 1.50, I'm not writing that zero unless it's significant. Okay? If I give the zero, it's because it's significant. And so the reason why this matters is it's a little bit different. If you wanted to say that you only had a confidence of about 10 grams in that measurement, then you would say, it's, it should be reported as 1.5 times 10 to the 2. Or if you're talking stats class, you would say it's 150 plus or minus 10, as opposed to 150 plus or minus 1. Now, here's how you can prove this to you on why we round where we round in this particular problem. Think of what we're really saying. What we're really saying is when you see a number of 75 grams, it's not 75.0000 out to infinity grams. It's 75 grams 
with that last digit being uncertain. Like we're uncertain in, in that digit. So 75 grams should be kind of thought of as 75 plus or minus one gram. Okay, so if one of those measurements is off, if one of them was really supposed to be 76 and the other one was 75, and we do that arithmetic, what does that answer come out to? 151. If it's really one lower, if it's really 74 plus 75, that comes out to be 99, um, that comes out to be 149. Like our variation is coming in that last placeholder when we think about how the errors that are inherent in the number like 75 grams play a role in that particular math step. So you can kind of prove it to yourself. If, you, if you're adding two numbers, the last digit is the one that contains kind of some uncertainty. The minimum uncertainty would be like plus or minus one in that unit. Um, and then you can think of like where in the result would that error come into play. Now let's think about the multiplication rule. Um, before we look at the subtraction example, let's do the multiplication division rule. Because there we actually count sig figs. It's actually kind of an easier rule to apply. Because when we multiply or divide, answers are rounded to the same number of digits as the measurement with the fewest number of significant figures. Okay, so here we're just counting sig figs. So if we do two sig figs times two sig figs, the result's rounded to two significant figures. So we do 75 times 75, this is 5625, is what that works out to, and we throw that into a calculator. If we're tracking units at square meters, um, just because we're not changing arithmetic, we're just changing the arithmetic of these values being measured quantities. So what I need to do is report that result with two significant figures. So I would just report that as either 5,600 square meters and do the proper rounding, up or down, so we'd round down here, 5,600 square meters. And if we wanted to be unambiguous, because if you just saw, if somebody wrote down 5,600 square meters, you may not know if they intend that to be two or three or four significant figures. But we, what we could do is express that as 5.6 times 10 to the 3 square meters. And by not writing any extra zeros, we're definitely showing only two digits are significant in that particular quantity. OK, now let's go back to that example of what if you know, the 75 there is really meaning 75 plus or minus 1 meters. And we're trying to avoid doing that statistics arithmetic with the plus minuses. You could do it in like a stats class, higher level chemistry classes go through that if you're really interested in seeing it. But just imagine in your mind, that you're doing 75 times 76 in like the worst case scenario. 75 times 76 turns out to be 5,700. If you do um, 50, uh, if you do 75 times 74, I don't remember that one, I have to do that calculation, but what's 75 times 74? Kind of in the other worst case scenario. It's 5,500. So if you're thinking of, OK, worst case scenario, it's either 5,700 or 5,500. If we're off by one up or down in one of the particular measurements, due to the inherent impreciseness of the number of what we're talking about, uh, that 75 written as a 75 implies the plus minus is in that one's placeholder. So now, do you see where the digit is off? Like, it's off in that hundreds placeholder. That means that the digits that come after those placeholders are not significant. Like, the last digit of significance is where you're seeing that variability, where you're seeing that waffling in that last digit as you think about the errors in the particular calculations um, carrying through. So that's why we're going to round this result to two significant figures. So I'm only showing you this because like, if you forget the rule of multiplication, you can more or less pick a couple simple numbers and then kind of see by yourself if you consider the plus minuses and how they might dictate um, through the sort of uh, arithmetic on that problem. OK, but just, there's just really two rules. And then the third rule that's important is when we do multi-step problems, we're just going to apply these rules in like sequential order. OK, so let's look at this subtraction step, then look at the multi-step problem next. So when we're doing subtraction, we use that addition subtraction rule. It only matters that we look at the placeholders. The final result's going to have to go to the hundredth placeholder um, so when we do this uh, arithmetic here, this is going to be 0.01, and then it's going to be 20. So 20.01 grams is what that works out to. And that ends up having four significant figures. And it's because we have to look at the placeholders when adding and subtracting. So the result has to go to the same placeholder of whatever the placeholders is greater in quantity. Well, they're both to the hundredths placeholder. So therefore, the result should be rounded to the hundredths placeholder. 
OK, so when we're doing sig figs, what we're trying to do is just see, should we round the result? Should we keep the digits? Should we add uh, some <laughs> significance onto a 0? Like on our first example, we saw 150 actually had three sig figs, and we thought about the sig figs in that problem. Uh, let's think about the multi-step problem here. If we just did uh, 7.5 plus 2.6, how many sig figs would that result have? Well, if we write the number out, I think we can see it. It ends up being uh, 10.1 grams, and we have to report that to the tens placeholder because of the addition rule. So we got to look at uh, tens place plus tens place, rounds to the tens place, then we divide by three sig figs. <coughs> Three sig figs going into three sig figs, we're going to keep all three digits, or we'll keep three digits off that number when we do the arithmetic. So we do 10.1 divided by 4.55, comes out to 2.22 grams per milliliter once we round. So the key is kind of seeing, like, if you, if you did the problem, you got all those extra digits on your calculator, and it's... You know, we don't always just want to say, we'll just write down three sig figs and it's always three sig figs. We want to look at the numbers, see what they mean, what they imply, look at their inherent impreciseness, and have that be our guiding factor with the sig fig rules on how we round our final results. So the last rule where it says track the number, or I'm sorry, um, uh, so the last rule, track the number of appropriate digits throughout a multi-step problem, but round off only at the end. We'll do a couple more examples that kind of walk through this, but we're going to apply the sig fig rules sequentially as we're doing the problems, like with the order of math operations, we're thinking of the sig figs, and, but generally we're trying just to round that final time at the end of the problem. Um, so i talk about a few things. I did have a few examples um, here. Why don't, why don't you guys just spend a minute or two on these problems, and then at some point after about a minute, I'll start writing in the answers. And then maybe we'll just review the answers at the start of class um, next time. So you can work together, whatever you want to do, for the next couple minutes. Okay, I, I guess I'll highlight these real quick. 125 for the first, I don't know if you guys agree with that. 2.00 um, grams per milliliter. We got three sig figs divided by three, so we go out to three sig figs. 
The reason why the 125 was, you know, we get around to the ones placeholder, so we're looking at the higher quantity placeholder to round the first result. Um, the next one, this is kind of like the previous example. But the last one is the one I just kind of want to spend a few moments on. Did anybody get through that one? Like, when you make your conversion and we're using a conversion factor, that's like a perfect conversion. So there's like exactly 2.54 centimeters in one inch. These are like exact numbers. This is not something that we look at 2.54 as having three significant figures. So we have to be really careful that we do characterize the measured quantities or the inexact quantities of what we're tracking sig figs through problems. Um, I will still rehash these problems at the start of next lecture uh, one more time um, to make sure we're on the same page. We'll look at some more examples as we um, get through that topic. But where I wanted to um, end today was um, quickly alluding to a couple things that we didn't talk about uh, at the first lecture. One of those is um, the course weighting. I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but the class is worth 62.5% in the form of exams. So really heavily weighted towards the exams. Um, homework's only 7.5%. Recitation's 5%. Lecture's 5%. Like, if you go to recitation, come to lecture, you're going to get those points. If you um, do the homework, you'll get most of those points, if not all those points. The key is how do you get those exam points? So that's where doing like these daily quizzes, catching up with the readings, watching some lecture videos, those will help you get through the class. Make sure to check out those daily quizzes. I'll put one up Monday through Friday, not necessarily over the weekends, but it'll give you a chance to quiz yourself um, at least five times a week. I'll even have some review materials starting next weekend um, that you can start thinking about if you want to get even more practice. Uh, we do grade on a curve. Maybe we'll talk more about that as you guys are packing up. But the key here to get a good grade is that exam performance. You know, we have so many points that are given out at the exam. We got to get really good at learning the content and then applying it to problem solving. That's why I want you to really think about practicing, taking a lot of quizzes, practicing the material, and trying to learn how to solve problems without your book open as you go throughout the semester. Okay, guys, uh, we'll end here for today. We'll see you back here on Monday. Have a great weekend. I was, I was doing some of the problems.